time. I'm your host, Matt Slick, again, and uh, I hope you all had a good uh, good Fourth of July holiday. I did. Lots of fireworks, lots of fun, lots of people, uh, lots of kids having a good time. Really enjoyed that. You know, I always enjoy the the fireworks because the kids are so great, and they really get a kick out of them. I just enjoy watching that more than anything else, actually, so it's a lot of fun. And... Um, Let's see, we've got a lot of things happening. We've got a special guest in tonight, a Roman Catholic apologist on the air with me here. We'll get to him in a second. I'm just going to give you some more information on some stuff later. I'm going to be uh, starting a a series on Mormonism starting a a week from tomorrow night. That's uh, the 14th of July at a local church. I'll give you more information tomorrow on that. If you're interested in going, you can just email me at carmstuff at yahoo.com. You can do that. You can also uh, just go to the Carm homepage, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G, and you can uh, check it out there. Uh, The email's at the bottom of the page. And uh, like I said, I'll give you more information tomorrow about that. Also, I'm doing a Bible study on Friday night, so we're going to be moving it to that church, it looks like, as well, Um, hopefully. Everything should be fine. So anyway, I think that's it. Uh, let's get to our guest, a uh, Dr. Sue Jenis. Is that right? Son Jenis. Son Jenis. You know, I apologize. No problem. Ah oh, man, I, that's what I thought it was, and then one of the guys wrote something different, so that's why I got that one. Yeah, I think it was your uh, guy that led me to the program. He said he said it wrong, also. Oh, okay. Well, my bad. My name's easier to say. You know, slick. So <laughs> I'd rather have some genus than slick. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're a buck-toothed skinny kid like I was going to a lot of different schools, uh, then, yeah, you don't want my name. <laughs> but uh, that's the way it goes. So uh, thank you for coming on the show. I really yeah. appreciate it. And uh, you are a Roman Catholic, right? Yes. And you are a hardcore Roman Catholic. I guess you would say that. And you like to defend the Christian faith, or excuse me, the Roman Catholic faith. I'll say. Yes, the Christian faith. Okay, and um, I, I, I don't know. Have you read stuff? Uh, my view on Roman Catholicism. I don't want to offend um, you. But... I, you know, I've never heard of you, Matt. But okay. somebody, uh, your uh, guy that put together this program, <clears throat> talked to me yesterday and led me to your website. So I looked at a couple things. So I just have to say, I, I looked at a couple YouTube videos mm-hmm. of you and Catholicism. So mm-hmm. I don't know too much about you, but I think I know enough to uh, know you know where you're coming from. Right. Um... Basically, I don't consider Roman Catholicism to be Christian, mm-hmm. right? And no offense, no, I meant. didn't either for a while too, because I was a Protestant for 18 years mm-hmm. okay. before I came back to the Catholic Church. Okay. So I understand w- why you feel that way. Yeah, I definitely uh, definitely believe it's uh, it's apostate. I don't mean to be offensive, but I don't believe it's Christian, and uh, I believe that Roman Catholics who believe official Roman Catholic theology are going to be lost and go to hell mm-hmm. and on the Day of Judgment. And you know, I I, I don't know if you, how clearly you hold to official Roman Catholic theology. Uh, you know, rebooting my laptop, so when it gets noisy here in a minute, you'll know why. Uh, you know, official Roman Catholic theology says if you're outside the Catholic Church, you're lost. So I don't know if you hold to that or not, but uh, I see that's what the old councils are saying. Well, actually, it says from uh, Benedict or, or from uh, Boniface the Eighth and Eugene the Fourth, it says if you remain outside the Catholic Church, you cannot be saved. Okay. It doesn't mean that if you're not a member full-fledged of the Catholic Church, you cannot be saved. Right. Yeah, I, I will definitely, for the rest of my life, absolutely remain outside the Roman Catholic Church, and I will also advocate that everybody leave the Roman Catholic Church and never go to it. That's my position. Yeah. So I guess I'm going to be lost to go to hell, right? Well, usually what I ask people to do is to hold their conclusions until after the debate is over, and maybe you might change your mind after we discuss these things. Yeah, well, yeah, well that's fine. I, I like uh, people differing opinions on the show. I really appreciate that. And... Um, we were supposed to talk tonight about uh, the Assumption of Mary, mm-hmm. and uh, maybe you could just tell people what that is and why you believe it. Let me get into well, it. Well, what it is is that uh, at the end of Mary's life, um, what happened to her body and soul? And mm-hmm. The church believes that her body and soul were assumed into heaven. And I, let me just let me explain that by making a distinction between assumed and ascension, because. We believe that Jesus ascended into heaven, as Acts chapter 1 teaches. Mary was assumed, um, being that someone else took power over her and and took her to heaven, whereas Jesus ascended by his own divine power. Uh, But we do believe that is uh, what happened to Mary. Uh, We believe this um, because the church teaches it. And the church is uh, one of our authorities, along with scripture and tradition. Uh, We have no problem believing it because the scripture itself uh, uh, talks about various instances where the bodies of uh, human beings were assumed into heaven, like Elijah, for example. 
there's no place in the Bible that rejects being assumed into heaven. Uh, so, you know, we have no problem in uh, accepting that as a doctrine. And it's not as if it just came out of thin air, you know, in the 20th century, uh, in 1950, when Pius XII declared it a doctrine of the church. It's not as if he just woke up one morning and said, oh, I think we ought to believe in the Assumption of Mary. Uh, this was a doctrine that was talked about among the patristic errors, uh, the patristic, uh, in the patristic era, and in, in the medieval ages, uh, prior to the year 1000, there were many instances uh, where they were already talking about Mary being assumed into heaven, but it hadn't been made into any doctrine as yet. And uh, the groundswell of this continued throughout the uh, second millennium until it finally reached a peak where the Pope had to make a decision uh, what he was going to do with this uh, common consensus of belief, and uh, he decided to make it a doctrine of the Catholic Church. So that's why we believe it, because uh, our authority uh, declared it to us from the tradition that has been passed down to it. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious, what's the earliest attestation, supposedly, from the Church Fathers that um, talks about the Assumption of Mary? Well, we have Epiphanius in 377 discussing the issue. Uh, we have uh, Ambrose and Augustine discussing the issue as well. They're, they're uh, debating back and forth whether Mary actually died or not. They don't know. They have difference of opinion on it. Uh, and then we come to the later... Uh, well, that, that's your patristic evidence. Uh, and, you know, we fully admit that the patristic evidence for the assumption of Mary is is, uh, is scant at best, uh, but that's not where we uh, lie our decision on whether Mary was assumed. We don't have any doctrine in the Catholic Church that says if there's uh, no teaching in the Fathers on this, then uh, we know it's not a doctrine of the Church. That's just not what we've ever taught. Okay. We have also John Damas <coughs> in the 7th century, uh, saying that Mary was assumed into heaven. Uh, there is uh, Germanus of uh, Constantinople in 733 who says the same thing, and you know, there's other examples I can give you. So there is a pedigree of belief of the assumption of Mary in the Christian history. So how do you know if those uh, teachings uh, by some of the patristics were, uh, are, are true? How, I mean, how do you know? Just because the Catholic Church, you know, as a Roman Catholic, you'll believe what the Roman Catholic Church tells you. I don't. Um, I just only believe the, oh, well, I believe in the final authority of the Word of God, and I subject everything to it. So, uh, you know, I, if a patristic father says one thing, I have a saying, you know, my church father can beat up your church father. Hold on one sec. <coughs> I had to clear my throat there. And so I can find, you know, patristic fathers who will say different things, um, but the Roman Catholic Church, uh, because of its multitudinous errors in other areas, Mary worship, um, purgatory, uh, synergistic soteriology, sacerdotalism, and things like that, I have a lot of problems with it. But what, how do you know that this doctrine is true? Well, I mean, you just go back into the early history of the Church and you find out what happened. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.15 says the Church is the pillar and ground of the truth. So there you have it, right from the get-go. It doesn't say Scripture is a pillar and ground of the truth. It says the Church is. You have Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus gives the keys to Peter and the apostles in Matthew 18. You have Acts chapter 15, where the debate over circumcision arises, and Peter stands up and says, we're no longer going to practice circumcision. And he had no scriptural precedent to do so. You have John 14, 16, where Jesus says to the disciples, I will lead you into all truth, and I will be with you forever. So here we have it, that Jesus is guaranteeing that he's going to guide the church into truth. And that's what happened. That's why we believe that Christ is uh, homo usios and not homo ouiousios, as the Arians had held. Who's going to decide that? The Bible doesn't decide it for us because the Bible doesn't get into those issues. The church has to decide it because God gave the keys of the kingdom to the church to decide these very issues for us. So yes, we're quite proud of the fact that it's not the individual Joe on the street that determines these things for us. It's not Matt Slick that's going to determine it for us. It's the church that gives us, and the church was given that authority by Jesus Christ himself. What makes you think the Roman Catholic Church is a true church? Because we have the pedigree. We can go back all the way to the beginning. We what? have popes in every century. The, the succession was passed on, and there's no break in it. Your, your church started, I don't know when, maybe in the 1600s, 1700s, so you have no pedigree. Is a pedigree necessary? 
Yes, it is. Why? Because you have an unbroken chain of authority. If you have somebody come along and say, well, we're going to start a new church because we don't believe your church is the true church, and we're going to start this church 1,700 years after the other church was started, well, anybody with common sense knows that you, you can't have a, a, a church just starting out all by itself with its own authority. Why not? And then claiming to be the true church. Why not? Because you have no succession. You have no pedigree. Well, what you're telling me is that, you know, you're telling me Roman Catholicism. It's like when I talk to a Mormon. A Mormon will just make certain assumptions, begging the question, say, well, this is true because Joseph Smith said it's true. No, well, no. Yeah. A Mormon has Joseph Smith as his authority came along in the 1800s. Yes, I know that. So he has no pedigree either. Well, he, they will, I'm, I'm just telling you what they will say, okay? Oh, I know. But we yeah. don't say what they say. Well, you're saying basically the same thing. You're saying you have a pedigree. They claim a pedigree that goes back to John the Baptist. Well, uh, Matt, I mean, just use your common sense. If somebody came along after, uh, you know, John Adams was the president, he came along 50 years later and says, well, I'm going to be president now, well, what's, what are we going to say to him? Well, I'm sorry, uh, Joe, you can't be president because you don't pass the succession. You weren't elected in the succession of presidents all the way from the beginning. Well, six, it's you don't very have to simple to figure out. Well, a president is, is elected by vote, whether or not someone's assassinated or what dies in or old. It doesn't, yeah. Can you name any kind of hierarchy of authority that has ever existed in the history of the earth that doesn't go by the succession of the pedigree of the office that's cast down, that, that's, that's uh, transmitted through the centuries? Name, can you name me one? Well, it's a complicated kind of a question you're asking. Um, and, I know what I'm asking you. Yeah, I do. I don't think your question is very well put. The issue of the United States presidency is not that it's a succession of presidents and that you have to have one laying hands upon the other to have an authoritative system set up. That's not how it works. The okay. Well, how did they do it in the Old Testament? The system of the Constitution just simply says by vote, and then they swear in, and that's it. They, how did they do it in the Old Testament? The presidents? No, the, the leadership in the Old Testament. Well, depending on which era, in which context, people were appointed there by God, no era that raised by, by prophets. They all did the same thing. Did they all they lay passed hand? down their authority. <clears throat> From generation to generation. Did, did they do it by priesthood to priesthood? Did they do it by laying on of hands? Yes, they did. Okay. And so you have to have that authority, you're saying? Yes. Otherwise you're not a true church. Right. So if someone who receives Christ, they have the authority to call the children of God, really aren't in any authority at all? If right. they don't have any membership of the Roman Catholic Church? Well, we're not talking about that. We're, <clears throat> we're talking about whether you have authority or not. I have authority. Yeah, where'd you get it? From Jesus. Yeah. Yep. Did he talk to you or something? <laughs> well, actually, he, uh, let's just say, he manifested himself to me while I was um, um, receiving him, and he actually came in his presence. Can you prove that to me? Why would I have to prove it to you? Well, if I'm going to believe what you have to say, <clears throat> Matt, I need some proof that Jesus, that Jesus gave you the authority. I didn't say he gave me the authority. Oh, well, okay, where'd you get it then? I had the authority by the virtue of being a Christian. As many as received to them, to them he gave the right or the authority to be called the children of God. Yeah. And we who are kings and priests, douloi, slaves sure, of Christ, have Christian. that authority. I'm not saying you can't be called a Christian. I am I'm a Christian. Who has the authority to decide whether the assumption of Mary is a doctrine or not? Well, certainly not the Roman Catholic Church. Well, how do you know that? Because it violates Scripture. No, because yes. there's no place in Scripture that says the assumption of Mary is a wrong doctrine. Well, there's no place in Scripture that says it's the right one. And the Bible says we're not to exceed what's written. Where? 1 Corinthians 4, 6. No. Yes. No, it doesn't say that. Yes, it does. No. Yes, it does. Want to read it to you? Yeah, I, yeah read it. I, you know, now, I these things... Book on this, Matt. It's, good. Uh, then you should know. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. We have 20, 30 pages in our book, <clears throat> not by Scripture alone. It doesn't say what you say it says. Now, these things, I brethren... to you, Matt. I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that in us you might learn not to exceed what is written, in order that no, no one of you might become arrogant in behalf, one against the other. Have you ever studied that verse, Matt? Yes. Yeah. Do you know there's like eight possible interpretations of that verse and eight possible translations of it? Has the Roman Catholic Church officially interpreted that verse? No. Then you don't have any authority to tell me what it is or isn't now, do no, you? No, I'm just telling you that you can't tell me that you have a dogmatic interpretation of that verse because you have no authority to tell me. Oh, but what I did was I just quoted so we're not to exceed what's written, and you said, yes, we are. No, we I didn't even do anything except quote it to you. From. I quoted it to you, and you, did, you denied it. What? No, what version are you reading from? The American Standard. Which one do you want? Well, you read another. Go read the King James Bible. It has a completely different translation. Completely different? Completely different. Okay. Uh, who both will bring... version has a completely different translation. Therefore, judge 
nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both doth bring to light the, the hidden things of darkness and will make, oh, it's wrong verse, it's for, verse 5, sorry, 4, 6. Make sure I'm in the right chapter because this computer program sometimes wigs. Hold on. And these things, brethren, I have, a fig I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. Yeah, you see how different it is? Well, I, don't, don't, don't think, think above, above, what is above that which is written. What does it mean to, to not think above what is written? What does it mean? Because they were puffing mm -hmm. up themselves, and they were puffing up people in the, in the Corinthian church. That's why they said, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos, I'm of this. Paul says, don't do that. Above, above what is written. What was written? What, what he gave them that was written. Which okay? was but it doesn't teach sola scriptura. It well, just says, don't put us above what I wrote to you. Do you know? Do you know what's just curious? Do you know what sola scriptura is? Yeah, it's the belief that Bible only is your authority. No. Okay, tell me what you think it is. No, I know what it is. And what it is is that the scriptures are the final authority. Doesn't mean we don't look at tradition or councils. It means there's the final authority no. in whatever well, it speaks. I said only authority. That you know, I mean, when I say only, I'm talking about it being the supreme authority. Well, that's that not the word you use. Contextually, you know, authority and well, only and supreme are different. But uh, so the Bible tells us we're not to exceed what's written. Okay. No, and it doesn't say that. Uh, we just read the King James Bible that doesn't say that. Well, why do you just go with King James? Well, isn't that the, you know, I, I'm just telling you, Matt, that there are eight different translations of that verse. It, well, it, the it's literal... It's for you to make a claim that this is teaching sola scriptura. You're going to have to do your homework. No, I didn't say that. Which is examining all the, pa all the Bible verses in the Greek. Do you know the Greek language? Yeah, I had four and a half years of Greek. Okay. Did you ever examine the Greek language of 1 Corinthians 4, 6? Uh, yes, I have. Okay. I'm looking at it in the Greek right now. Did you ever did you ever examine the textual variants in no, First Corinthians? No, I don't think I have. Okay, they're multitudinous. Okay. okay, this is one of the most difficult passages in the Bible because there are about <clears throat> ten different variants between verses uh, four and five. Okay. okay, and what you're going to need to do is go study those variants and study all the translations of them before you make any hard and fast conclusions about what it's teaching. Well, I don't have any problem doing that, and I know that you should do it, but you can't say the Roman Catholic Church has officially interpreted it, so your guess, so to speak, is as good as mine. No, so why I don't we just look at it together? The You're the one who offered the verse. It's yes, I did. Doctrine. And I quoted it, and you denied it. No, I didn't deny it. I yes, you did. That you, that you know what it's talking about. I know what it's talking about. It says you might learn, mathete ta me uper, that you might learn the not beyond what has been written, gegraptai, that not what has been written. Don't exceed, don't learn or go beyond what is written. That's what the literal Greek says. Okay, let's do this, Matt. Let's, let's go in the back door on this one. Was Paul teaching oral, oral teaching to or oral inspired teaching to the Corinthians at this point in time? Oral inspired. I'm not sure what you mean by oral inspired. Okay, oral teaching that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. I don't know. I'm assuming that the things that he was th saying were authoritative, but uh, there are certain oral traditions or certain things that he said that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't have any problem yeah, with that reality. There are some things that Paul taught. I would assume so. Well, you need to be definite on this. If, you would, know, if, you know, if you're not definite on this, then you're disagreeing with Scripture. No, I would just... Is that Paul taught by oral inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You got a verse for that? Yeah, First, first Thessalonians 2.13. First Thessalonians 2.13. Okay, it's about tradition that we laid, that we gave to you, yeah. Yeah. You read it. Well, it says this, And for this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as word of men, but for what it really was, the word of God. Yeah. Okay, it's the word of God. Yeah. He's teaching them orally, and it's the word of God. So Paul, God. Paul did that? Yeah. Okay. And Paul's the one who wrote 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Yes, he did. Okay, so if Paul is telling them that not to go beyond what is written in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, well, then how can he be teaching them oral teaching that's inspired by the Holy Spirit also? Easy. Because the oral tradition, anything that Paul would say orally, would certainly not contradict the written word. Oh, so it's okay for them. <laughs> you just trapped yourself. No, I didn't. You yes, did. You did, because you're saying that you really don't believe in sola scriptura as long as the, as the teaching that's inspired by the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict scripture. That's why I asked you what sola scriptura was. So how can you believe in uh, the scripture as a final authority if you still believe oral teaching by the Holy Spirit is still valid today? I didn't say it was still valid today. Well, when did it stop? See, you keep putting words into my mouth. When did it stop? 
Oh, I don't know when it stopped, but I do not believe it continued after the apostles. I'm going to say it, it uh, stopped with the apostles. I don't believe in this, this um, se sequence, supposedly, for the Roman Catholic authoritative system down through the apostles. I don't believe that for a second. Well, we're not I don't find that in Scripture. That right now. We're talking about 1 Corinthians 4, 6. You claim that this taught sola scriptura. No, I didn't I'm say that. You. I said you're not to exceed what's written. I trapped you, and you fell into sola it. Sola scriptura or not? No, sola scriptura means, I'll say it again, so we're arguing the right point. No, does sola, is sola scriptura taught in 1 Corinthians 4, 6? Define what you mean by sola scriptura. Uh, we'll use your words. You said it's the final authority. Yes. Okay, now where does Paul say that scripture is the final authority? You want those words? The yeah. final authority? Yeah. Come on, you're better than that. No, you're better than that. No, you are. You keep doing this. Look, I, let me tell you something, man. I've talked to cultists left and right for 30 years, and what they do is what you do. Redo the question and insert words into the sentence that I don't say, and then say, now you're going you're to agree with it or not. Don't play the game with me. You know that's not what it says. You know it doesn't say exactly those words. What you're redoing, what you're doing is rearranging the sentence to make it say what I never said. No, I'm not going to play that game. Well, You're better than that. Use the word "final authority" in contrast to my word "only." I'm asking you where the Bible uses the word "finally." You don't have a verse for that. No, we don't, don't have, have the word. The Bible that uses the word "trinity" either. Excuse me. We don't have the Bible using the word "trinity" either or "hypostatic union." Yeah, and who gave you the Trinity? Who was the first one to teach you the Trinity? God. Yeah, and who did God give it to? He gave his, it to the His church. regenerate people. Excuse me? His regenerate people, the elect. Uh, well, that's called the Council of Ephesus and the Council no, of Ephesus. No, 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 no. No, it wasn't. That's a... where the doctrine came from. No, 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 it is, that's wrong. Oh, really? The, yes, the doctrine can you, came... Can you prove that? I can prove it because I can go to the documents <laughs> and show you. God gave it to us. The church recognizes the voice yeah, the of church, God. That's what the church says, too, that God gave it to the church. The God, the, the church isn't the Roman Catholic Church, okay? It's not some organizational structure. The Mormons say that. The Jehovah's Witnesses say, say that. What's the, the true church? It's the church that I belong to with its authoritative system. We have the true tradition, and they have all variations of the same kind of yeah, claim you that you've got. have the church that you've made up in your own mind. I made it up? Yeah. What did I make up? Because you have no pedigree. You have no success. My pedigree you comes from Jesus. Jesus. And I, you woke up one morning and you say, well, I, I think God talked to me and, and Jesus is doing this and he's giving me the authority because I'm a Christian. That's what you have. That's not you what know, I said. You don't have an authority. Why, why That's you? why there's, there's 10,000 different denominations out there. Uh -huh. And lots different. of different sects inside of Roman Catholicism. Why do you keep adding to the words of what I'm saying? Adding to the words? I'm not adding to the yeah, words. Yeah, you are. You keep doing I'm that. The one who, I'm the one who told you that the Holy Spirit taught oral revelation by inspiring the people he taught. And lots of, you weren't I, even sure that that was the case. No, I wanted to understand what it is you're saying. I understand the Roman Catholic position on, Roman, on the tradition and the oral aspect. The way you're saying that it's inspired, I've done this enough to know. I need to make sure of what you're saying, which is why I'm asking you to define your terms repeatedly. Do you got any scriptures to show the assumption of Mary? I don't need any scriptures. You don't need the no. word of God to make your position valid? No, because where does the Bible say that I have to have a verse of scripture for every doctrine that's believed in the, in the Christian faith? There you go. There you go. Where does it say that, man? It doesn't say those exact words. I, I know it doesn't. So you can make up anything. I think maybe no, God might be a God of another anything. planet. No, we go by the tradition, as I told you at the beginning of the show. We go by scripture, and we have a magisterium to decide if there's any discrepancies or ambiguities or whatever. We have a final authority to decide what tradition the scripture is saying. It's very simple. You have a Roman Catholic tradition, Roman well, Catholic whatever, whatever magisterium. Whatever that's what started 2,000 years that's ago. That's not what started. It's been broken. No, it's that's, been that's what the Roman Catholic Church says. Give me scripture. Give me the inspired word of God. I don't have to give you, you don't have any. the inspired word of God for the assumption of Mary unless you can prove from your scripture, which you hold as your final authority, that that's what I have to do. The Bible says don't exceed what's written. Let me see you some half of the scripture. The Bible also says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that the scripture is worthy of reproof and correction and teaching. So the Bible points to itself as being the thing of what you are to trust in inspiration and teaching. I'm asking you. And it says in 1 Peter 3.15, 1 Peter 3.15, to give an answer to everyone who would ask you. I'm asking you to do it from Scripture. I'm not going to believe Roman Catholic theology. I'm just going to be Roman yeah. Catholic tradition when it gives me the stuff that it does about Mary. You've got to be kidding me. Let's deal with the verses that you pointed out, Matt. 1 Timothy 3.16 doesn't say that Scripture is the final authority. It doesn't say Scripture is self-sufficient. It says Scripture is profitable for truth. Okay. That's all it says. Okay. Is it? 
Yeah, sure it is. That's why I use it, and that's why you use it. Use it. I want you to use it to demonstrate your position from those scriptures. I don't have to, because that's not what the Bible demands of me. It the Bible isn't? says scripture is profitable. It doesn't say it is self-sufficient. It doesn't say it's oh. the final authority. So then you can believe whatever you want. No. Yes, you can. Believe in tradition, scripture, and mm -hmm. the magisterium. You'll believe whatever the Catholic Church tells you. Well, because that's the authority that God put in place. That's what the Roman Catholic Church told you. No, that's yes. what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18. No, that's, that's give me a break. Come on. Acts 15. Petros and Petros, you know this stuff. Why would you, why would you do that? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about oh, here. Boy. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. It says that the church is the authority, <clears throat> and the church was 2,000 years ago. Which church? So if anybody comes and tells me that they're the church when I know that they're not teaching the same thing as the church of 2,000 years ago, then I know it's false. How would you know if anything's true or false? Because it contradicts Roman Catholicism? No, because the church was put in place by God as more authority. Mm -hmm. So if the scriptures say one thing, the church says another, which do we go with? Never happens. <laughs> yeah. Luke 128? Yeah. Okay. Mary's full of grace, right? Yeah. That's not what it says in the Greek. Oh, really? Uh -huh. You know what Kek Terry Tomine means? Yeah, it's a highly favored one. No, um, it can mean that. It can be translated mm -hmm. as highly favored one. It can also be translated full of grace. Full of grace is used twice specifically of Jesus and of, of uh, um, Stephen. I'm just telling you what the Greek word Kek Terry Tomine can mean. And it can mean. So Back to the Septuagint, you can look at, at all the usages of the, <clears throat> in the Septuagint all the derivatives of keritomene, and you will see that it can be translated in either way. So you cannot make a case that it has to be translated highly favored. Plaras caritas occurs only two places. Literally, it is full, plaras, caritas, grace. That's it. It doesn't say that of Mary in 128, in Luke 128. That keritomene is a perfect passive participle. It's not going to have the same form that you just mm -hmm. read. You're about. exactly right, which is why it's not used of Mary. Excuse me? It's not used of Mary. It is not used of Mary, the phrase, full of grace. No, there are several ways to say full of grace in, in Greek. You don't have to have kekateri tomene. You can have plane gratia if you want to. And that's used in many places in the, in the New Testament. So you're trying to confine this to one specific phrase. You can't do that. Well, I'm just telling you that the phrase is used, uh, plaras caritas, full of grace. Yeah, that's what it literally is. Caritomene does not have to be translated as highly doesn't, favored. Doesn't have to be. It has the it has the Greek root word charis in there. Yeah, blessed one, yeah, highly it can favored. Also mean graced one, because that's where the word comes from. And so you're going to derive from that that she was sinless and therefore worthy of an assumption well, in the marriage. I'm going to use heaven. that as support for the doctrine. I'm not going to say that Luke 21, Luke 20, Luke 128 teaches. The Immaculate Conception, no ands, ifs, or buts about it. I'm not saying that. You're the one who's saying that. I didn't say that. I'm well, saying that no, I didn't say Luke 128. All the evidence that it has no. in tradition, scripture, no. and the magisterium makes a decision, and she did so in 1854. Yeah, the church did. The Roman right. Catholic Church did. I, well, I would expect the church, too, because that's what Peter did in Acts 15. Well, he stood up for the church and made the decision. And Peter was rebuked as well. We know that. No, he wasn't he, rebuked in Acts 15. He was he also rebuked for a private mishandling uh -huh. of, of Gentiles in, in Galatians chapter 2, which is a totally different story. And in Matthew 18, we know that the same keys were added to the apostles as well. No, it wasn't just him to the church. The keys were given to Peter alone. The keys were no. not given to the apostles. Yes, they in were. 15. No, they were. Oh, man. They were not given the keys. Okay. I'll tell you what. Um, I like to see scripture because uh, the scripture is what judges tradition. Yeah, where does the scripture teach that? <laughs> you went to the scripture to validate your tradition. When you, you made a statement. Man. I am. I'm giving you the, the answer. Scripture teach I'm, the scripture I'm answering tradition. you. I'm answering you. First Thessalonians 2.13. You went there. You went to the scriptures, didn't you, to validate your tradition, didn't you? No. You didn't go to the scriptures? That's all. I'm not saying it. Wait a minute. First Thessalonians 2.13. Wait. First Thessalonians 2.13 is not scripture that you went to? It wasn't scripture. I said I went to it as evidence. I didn't say I went to it as proof that scripture has authority over tradition. So do you ever use the Bible to substantiate tradition at all? Yeah, but that doesn't mean scripture is the final authority over tradition. So if you use the Bible, is it authoritative over scripture? I mean, it's going to be over tradition or is the tradition over, or are they completely equal? It's neither. It's completely equal? Yeah. How do you know? Because that's Roman what scripture can. says, and that's what Whoa! scripture teaches, and that's what tradition says. So the scriptures teaches it.
scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. Well, I don't hold to the magisterium. I don't well, hold that, to, uh, Let's no, just I'm use sorry. your authority. Your own scripture. authority says really? that scripture and tradition are equal. They do? Where? Well, didn't Paul just say in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 that when he spoke the oral revelation of God, he was inspired as if it was the word of God? And didn't you agree with me that it was inspired? No, I said it's most probably, okay? Well, this is what it says. Read, I, then, I, then I asked you, I said, are there instances where Paul was, oral, <clears throat> was inspired by the Holy Spirit to give oral revelation? And you said yes. Yeah, so? Okay, so if he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the writers of the New Testament are inspired by the Holy Spirit, well, how can there be error in either one of them? They both have to be equal. That's correct. So is that tradition? Yeah. So when, when Paul would speak an authoritative something to a to the Thessalonians, that's tradition? Well, what does 1 Thessalonians 2.13 say? And for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received us by the word, excuse me, received from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but from what it really is, the word of God. Okay? So that's tradition? Yeah. Where does it say tradition in there? Well, then you, you, you go a little bit further, 2 Thessalonians 2.15 and you'll find out where Paul talks about tradition. Who both and killed the Lord Jesus the prophets, drove us out, not, not pleasing to God, but hostile to men. That's two Second verses. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Oh, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, sorry. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or letter from us. There you have it. Okay, so the scriptures say we should listen to tradition? Yeah. So the scriptures authenticate the tradition. Yeah. So the Bible says in Hebrews 7, 7 through 10, the lesser is blessed by the greater. So well, that's talking about people. It certainly it's is. It's talking about Jesus and talking and about and all those people. It's not no, talking about scripture. No, though. it's talking about uh, Melchizedek, Abraham, and Levi. And it's talking about the people and, and authority who had the authority to tell, because they were prophets, it had authority. The lesser is blessed by the greater. It's a principle of Scripture. Matt, you look, would, I'm an, I, I've been exegeting Scripture for 35 years. What you're doing is conflating text of Scriptures that are not in the same context. It's called okay. a category mistake or illegitimate totality transfer. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 is talking about Scripture and tradition. Hebrews 7 is not talking here. It's talking about the Old Testament sacrifices of Melchizedek and Abraham and Levi. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to teach us about the new covenant in Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. It's a totally different topic. Okay. Okay. Let's stick with 2 Thessalonians 2 then. Okay. Because I'm not going to convince you on that. So, you go to the scriptures to authenticate your tradition. Did you not? Sure. Okay. So then, if you have to go to the scriptures to get the validity for your tradition, you're going to the authority, which is God's word, to validate what you think is your tradition. No, I'm going to God's no. word to validate God's word. God's You've word. already agreed that the oral tradition is God's word. No. Oh, no, 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 no. No, I did not. I said what Paul had said to the Thessalonians, some of the things he said under inspiration, that could be fine. I don't make the jump that, oh, now it's just tradition. I don't just say whatever he says or the apostles say is now tradition because I know what you're going to do with this. I've talked to many Catholics. If Paul is just saying something to them, that's the authority, that's the whole door that we're going to drive the truck of heresy through. And you're going to say, you know what? Now we can do all kinds of stuff. Now we can do purgatory. We can do praying to saints. We can do everything that's not even in the scriptures. Why? We're not because talking about that, Matt. We're not I know. talking about purgatory. We're not talking about sacerdotalism. We're just talking about 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Yes, and I'm telling you what the Catholics do with it. Well, I didn't do that, Matt. Okay? You, oh. What I'm doing with you is I'm trying to get you, I'm trying to see what you understand about scripture. Is there an oral tradition that's inspired by the Holy Spirit or not? No. Well, then what 2 Thessalonians? What does 2 Thessalonians 2.15 say then? Define oral tradition. Well, the, the, did you read the word tradition in, in that? Define that oral tradition. to the traditions. What I mean and what you mean may be different. Oh, okay. Well, let's analyze that then. You mean oral tradition as in the passing of information down from apostles from your view down no, through the centuries. No, that's not what I mean. Okay, then what is it? The Catholic Church says that apostolic oral tradition that is inspired by the Holy Spirit is the only oral tradition that we are dogmatically uh, supposed to obey. That is, any oral teaching that was inspired by the apostles is what our oral tradition is. Any, let me, let me write that down. Piece of paper here. Hold on. Any 
oral tradition inspired by the what? Any oral teaching. Any oral teaching. Inspired by the apostles. Inspired by the, apo the apostles? Well, I mean inspired by the Holy Spirit okay. to the okay. apostles. Inspired by the Holy Spirit to the apostles. Okay. Is our oral tradition that we must be obedient to. Okay. So how do you know what is inspired? Well, how do you know um, what books are in the Bible? God, uh, well, Jesus tells us, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. We were, oh, we, well, the, so why can't that apply to the Catholic Church then? It only applies to you. Well, because the Roman Catholic Church is full of heresy from left oh, to right, okay. up and down. So, yeah, well, look, you're mm -hmm. putting the cart before the horse. No, you I'm not. prove that there's heresy first, okay? Well, we, how would you do that? Because we got to go to the scriptures. with me that Jesus told you what books were in the Bible. Yeah, no, 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 no. I didn't say that. that. I didn't say that. You, I didn't why, say that. Why does that just apply to Matt Slick and not to Catholic Church? No, 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 no. That's not what I said. Jesus said, his sheep hear his voice. The scriptures are the voice of God. The church recognizes the voice of God. That's what it does. Uh -huh. Because we're his sheep. Is that why Luther wanted to get rid of the book of James? Luther didn't know what he was doing. Oh, okay. So he, so the Holy Spirit wasn't talking to Luther. He, he, he uh, it wasn't one of the sheep. He didn't hear Jesus' voice, all that. Is that what you're telling me? Luther was wrong about James. The same way as the popes can say many heretical things, but if as long as it's not as cathedra, then it's okay. Uh, okay, so Come on at least now. it's more than the popes you believe it could be wrong. Well, I, blo I believe wrong. like Pope Pius XI. Calvin, can they be wrong too? Oh, absolutely. I'm a Calvinist. How about Matt Slick? Can he be wrong? <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Okay, so then how do you know which books are in the Bible then? Because the Christian church regenerated the, the eclectoi are the ones who've recognized the words of God. Well, you just said you can commit error. And so can Luther and so can everybody yeah. else. So how yeah. would you know? Uh-huh. Okay, we want the answer again? Yeah. The Christian church recognizes the word of God. God well, actually you works. You, Matt, well, you just, you just told me that you don't believe in some organizational structure of, 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 I didn't say of that. the church. I didn't, I, I, you keep switching back and forth. No, I don't. Between organizational structure and Matt Slick. No, I don't. Clarity. No, I don't. Now, that's, Which that's another thing the cults do, is they take it off the topic, put it on the Matt Slick. No, 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 no. You're, you no, mentioned no. my I'm name. by what you told me, Matt. You told me that you're one of the sheep and you hear Jesus' voice. And that's yeah, I do. And that's how you know which books belong in scripture. That's so. That's quite a jump. Then I asked you, do you make mistakes? Yes. Did Luther make mistakes? You yes. said yes. Yeah. So then how do, you, how do you know you didn't make a mistake about which books belong in the scripture? Uh, I didn't. I know. But how can you not say that if you admit to me that you make mistakes? It's easy. Here, ready? I didn't. Oh, so you don't make mistakes? Yeah, I make mistakes. Okay. So how do you know you didn't make a mistake about the scripture the, the books that belong in Scripture. Oh, I don't know. I just kind of read the Bible and go, hey, that's the Word of God. Like, just oh, like Jesus says. Oh, that's the way it happens. Well, yeah, geez. Jesus said, my Mormons sheep hear my voice. Thing, Matt. Well, we well, you know about the Mormons, don't you? Or you do know about them, I hope. Oh, I know about a, a lot of things, Matt. I know a lot of people in different denominations say a lot of different things about the Bible, whether it's Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or you or whoever it is. You don't think the Mormons are Christians now, do you? It's, it's, not, it's not an issue here. Well, you said, and other Christians. About Mormons. We're you said Mormons and other Christians. I just want to make sure you didn't think they were Christians. You don't, right? I mean, just for clarification, you don't think that, right? No. Okay, good. I just want to make sure. Well, I'm just making sure. Just making sure. All right. So, Anything else you want to talk about, Matt? Well, actually, there's lots of stuff I could talk about with you. Let's switch gears here. Let's uh, well, well, wait, 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 wait. I, just, I just wanted you to just, just to, to let me know, let, let the readers know, you don't have any verses to substantiate the assumption, the physical bodily assumption of Mary. Right, and you don't have any verses to teach Sola Scriptura or what the canon of Scripture is. So, well, I don't really even ground. If you can give me a passage that teaches Sola Scriptura and what books belong in the Bible, then I'll give you one that teaches the assumption of Mary. Is that a deal? Okay, uh, I'll tell you what. Um, I've asked you <laughs> to give me some Scripture, and you can't do it. I mean, you're just admitting you can't do it. That's okay. Right, because I don't have to, because Scripture you don't have to. Say you it. can't. I have to. Neither does tradition, neither does the church. Tradition is found in Scripture. Well, the only one to tell me I have to do it is Matt Slick. No. Lots of people tell you you should use the Word of God to substantiate your doctrinal positions. Okay. Because the Bible says don't exceed what's written. And the Bible says that the, that the inspired Word of God is what's good for reproof and correction. So I'm asking you, you know correct me from the I'm Scriptures. Gonna, I'm going to send you the paper that I wrote on 1 Corinthians 4, 6. And I want you to read that, and then I want you to call me back on your program, and then we'll talk about it, okay? Can you correct right me from now, Scripture? you're just making yourself look foolish. Whoa! You don't know what that verse says, because you've never really studied it. Okay. You've just taken a cursory understanding of what that sentence is without comparing it with other Scriptures, and without looking at the Greek, and without looking at the textual variants. You don't know what you're talking about. Actually, 
just, just a slight of a hint, I've actually done research on that verse and other references because I find it a very important verse. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I have done that. You used 1 Timothy 3.16? Yeah. You tried to make that look like sola scriptura? No, I said, that, I said, no, 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 Sorry, no, say that. no. What I said was, was profitable. yes, and it's for correction. I'm asking you, correct my error with scripture. No, it says it's profitable. It doesn't say I have to use Scripture only. Oh. I'm not getting it, Matt. In other words, you can't do it from the Word of God. Can't do what from the Word of God? Show me from the Bible, from God's Word, from His Scripture, any assumption of Mary teachings. Oh, why? Well, I've already told you that Scripture does not disagree with the assumption of Mary. I've already told you about Enoch being assumed into heaven. I'm not giving you scriptural uh, foundation for the belief that we have. If scripture said in you know, Hezekiah 3, verse 5, that the assumption of Mary is a false doctrine, or if, if it said in Joshua you know, 3, verse 6, that no one can be assumed into heaven, well, then you'd have a case, Matt. I couldn't say what I'm saying. So you, argue from, say any of that. so you argue from what it doesn't say, not what it does say. Well, Matt, you know what? I learned a long time ago not to assume things because it makes an ass out of you and me. Well, you're and the one making the assumptions. I'm not going to assume that Scripture doesn't allow an assumption if Scripture doesn't tell me so. How do you know the Roman Catholic Church is a true church? You go to the Scriptures, right? No, I don't go to the you Scriptures. You don't? I was born and raised in the Catholic Church. I was baptized in the Catholic Church, and my parents taught me about the Catholic Church. How do you know the Roman Catholic and Church is a true church? is one of our evidences. How do you know it's a true church? Excuse me? How do you know it's a true church? I just, we already opened the program with this debate, uh, Matt. How do you know? Said, we have the pedigree. We have the succession. No. You, can, you gave me no hierarchical structure in the whole history of the world that has ever rejected that uh, succession of authority. If you can name one for me that has any legitimacy, then I'll consider your position. Well, I don't consider your request legitimate. Oh, it isn't? It's no. just not right for me to ask you of any kind of system that doesn't have a succession of authority? Uh, I even asked you about the Old Testament. You have they, to, they, they passed down the authority by laying on of hands. I don't know if they did or didn't, to be honest. I don't well, know that in the priesthood. Did they, well, did they do that in the Old Testament? Did they lay hands on priests? Yes, they did. Okay. Kings, kings came kings, by yes, succession. Kings, Priests sure. came by, by, by okay. many in succession. Okay. Every, every passage you read about authority in the in the Bible, whether it's Old or New Testament, it's all by succession. There's never an instance where somebody, as a matter of fact, the instances where somebody tried to uh, step aside out of that structure, like uh, Korin uh, and, and, and Dathan and the, and the Baihu and, and all those uh, Old Testament characters, they were swallowed up by the earth. God wouldn't put up with it. Even Miriam, his own sister, uh, Moses' own sister, was given leprosy because she confronted Moses and said, no, he wasn't the only authority. You know what I mean? No, 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 that's not what happened. The reason he was given leprosy is because in, in Numbers chapter 12, Moses was marrying a Cushite woman. And he did, and Miriam and Aaron did not like that, and he struck her with leprosy well, and not saying. him. Do she, you know she why? She his authority. And God sided with Moses, not her. She Anytime was, you had anybody bucking the authority in the Old Testament, so God sided with the structure, not so, with the... Uh, people raising a fuss and thinking that they were an authority. So what you're saying is that any authority that the scriptures teach is the authority that is transmitted that you guys have in the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Uh, That's what you're saying. There's only one institution that can have it. You can't have five institutions having it or 10 or 20 or 28,000 as they have today. It just won't work that way. There's only one institution that can have the succession. And the Mormons even believe that. You know, they, they say, if you, if, you, if you go talk to them, they will tell you that if, it, if we aren't the, if they say that if the Mormons are not the true religion, then the only other possible ones it could be is the Catholic Church, because they have the pedigree. So you have to go to a cult to support your position? No, I'm just telling you what they say, Matt. Don't, don't try, try to change my words. I, I just asked what you. what you accuse me of doing. I asked you if that was what you were saying. Is, you, you have to go to a cult to do that? Is that right? No. Yes, you just did. Come on, Matt. You're Come on. Matt. <laughs> I think you are too. You shouldn't use the Mormons to hey, substantiate Matt, your I position. Love you, okay? We we just have different beliefs about our Christian faith. Hopefully, we're going to come to some agreement someday. No, it won't happen. And maybe when we're in heaven. I don't know. No. No yes? disrespect. Okay. No, no. I, I believe that, that you're completely lost. Oh, or do you? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I do well. because, well, you know, if you want to change topic, that's fine. But I believe you're lost. 
because the Roman Catholic Church teaches against Scripture. Really? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. N name one thing that it teaches against Scripture. I'm just curious. Um. Well, let's see. How about earning grace, or how about heaven as a reward for your good works? Ah, oh, okay, that's a good one. I wrote a book on that, 775 pages, called Not by Faith Alone. Okay. Did you ever read it? No. Okay, well, you should, because you are totally misrepresenting what the Catholic Church teaches. Really? Yep. Never once in the history of our dogmatic tradition have we ever taught that we earn our salvation, that we earn grace, that we earn anything. That it's our heaven, our salvation... Everything that we have is all by grace. You don't merit grace at all? No, nope, don't merit grace. You don't merit grace? No. Nope. Moved by the Holy Spirit and charity, we can merit for ourselves and for others the grace is needed for a second. That's education. talking about condign merit. It's not talking about strict merit. That's where you need to study the issue. Strict merit is when you earn something by your own work and the, the benefactor is not giving it to you out of a gift. Well, we're talking about merit there that, as the Council of Trent uses, it's talking about condign merit in which we do work. We don't deserve to be paid for it, but out of the bene benevolence of the giver, he gives us a reward for our work, but it's not earned. So one kind of grace you do earn and the other kind of grace you don't? No, we don't earn any grace if you're using the word earn in the strict sense of earning it by your own work and not by the benefic beneficence of the giver. Well, what does it mean when it says in the Catholic Catechism 2010, that you merit for ourselves and for others the greatest grace is needed for our saints. How, how are they meriting it? It's talking about the same merit I just told you about. Condign merit, which is the merit that we get when we work, but which not, that's what is owed to us. God does not owe us anything for our work. He gives it to us out of his grace. He, we sometimes call that merit in the sense that we are meriting God's grace. So if it's owed to you, it and is it's, not owed to us. You said... I, I said it is not owed to us. So there's no grace that's owed to you. Right. So you can't merit it. Right. But the catechism you says you do. You have to be careful to use the word merit in the proper sense. Yeah, which sense? The sense that I just described to you. And the sense three is... Three kinds of merit. Congruent merit, condign merit, and strict merit. Strict merit was, uh, was dogmatically condemned by the Council of Trent, Canon 1 saying that we cannot work for our salvation. We cannot work to do anything to get paid by God because he owes us nothing. Okay. That's strict merit, right? Strict merit, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't agree then that an eternal reward is for good works accomplished with the grace of Christ, that the heaven is a good work for that? Say, oh, wait a minute, Matt, you lost me there. Say it again. In every circumstance, each one of us should hope with the grace of God to persevere to the end and to obtain the joy of heaven as God's eternal reward for the good works accomplished with the grace of Christ. Yeah, reward, Matt, is the key word there. Reward does not mean that God owes us anything for what we do. He gives it to us out of his grace. So That's it's a reward, reward for the good works. Yeah. I have no problem receiving a reward for good works because God doesn't owe me anything for my good works. He so, gives it to me out of his grace. So let me get this straight. You're saying then that, that, that the eternal reward for good works is what's not earned. Right. So it's the eternal reward for good works, but the good works don't do anything. No, the good works uh, please God. That's what Scripture continually says. So, please God with your good works. So, God, in turn, because he's just and honest, will give you a reward for your work. But it's not because he owes you anything. So it's not because... It's very simple, Matt. I mean, I, I, I it's gotcha. more complicated here. It's very simple. No, I, we don't owe... God does not owe us anything for our work. What he gives us is out of a reward because he's a giver. He likes to give. So he gives us things for our work. Okay. That's all there's to it. So it says that you obtain the joy of heaven as God's eternal reward for the good works accomplished in the grace of Christ. Yeah, that's what it says. Yeah. And I just explained to you what that means. Wow. So you can stop misrepresenting the Catholic Church now. I don't know if that's what... <laughs> it's just, I mean, I hear the same thing. Go read the, the canon, canon 1 of the Council of Trent. Um, and then you'll find out exactly what I just told okay. you. Okay, I'll, I'll do that, I'll do that, all right, all right. I haven't read session all the Trent. Session 6, by the way. Session 6, Council 1, Session 6? Okay, I'll do that. I, I appreciate that, okay? That's fine. But uh, when I read the Catechism, it says, uh, you know, same thing the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses say. You know, a red flag goes up. You know, God's eternal reward for the good works accomplished with the grace of Christ. That's what Mormons say. The exact same thing. You just redefine the words. 
uh, Matt, you know, I don't really care what the Mormons teach, okay? I'm just telling you what Scripture teaches, what the Church teaches. Okay. Take it or leave it, okay? okay? You're the one representing what we, what we taught. You okay. said that we earned our salvation, we earned our return of life with God. I'm telling you, no. Okay. You are misrepresenting us. Okay, then how about this one? Catechism of the Catholic Church, 2068. So that all men may attain salvation through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. Yeah. So you attain salvation through faith, baptism, and observing the commandments. Sure. Because that, if I don't observe the commandments, it means I really don't love God. It means I really don't, you know, care about Him or anything. I'm just, you know, sort of passing the time, and I'm a nominal Christian. Okay, so I have no problem with obeying the commandments. No, but, no, no, but no. When God rewards me for obeying the commandments, he's not paying me. Okay. He's, he doesn't owe me anything. He's just giving me a reward for obeying the commandments. It doesn't say that. It says all men may attain salvation. It doesn't even get into the issue, but I'm telling you what it means. Well, you're telling what you say it means. No, but, I'm a Catholic apologist. I know what it means because I know what Canon 1 of the Council of Trent teaches. I'm okay. applying that to this 2068 that you're reading in the Catechism. Yeah, that yeah. says that you attain There's no salvation. Way to put things out of out of out of the uh, catechism and make a conclusion out of the math. I'm just reading what it says. It says know, you attain salvation through faith, faith, faith and observance of the commandments. The whole theology behind it before you start criticizing. Why would you teach you have to observe the commandments in order to get salvation? Oh, well, the same thing James says in James 2:24. Come on. That Abraham was justified by works, not by faith alone. What Isn't kind that of what faith? Scripture teaches you that. Know, you know the difference between ascension and fiducia, right? Yeah, I know the difference. I, that's what R.C. Sproul used, but it's fallacious. It's not fallacious yeah. because in it's, verse 14 of James 2, he talks James, about the dead kind of faith. 24 says he was justified by works and not by faith alone. I what don't know how kind of clear faith? it can be. It's clear in context. In context, yeah. So what's the context? Tell me. The context? It's really simple. If you read it, you start at verse 14. He talks about dead faith. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? No, it doesn't say that. That's what I've been reading the New American Standard is what it says. Yeah, no, the New American Standard is wrong. Oh. Go read the Greek translation of that passage. What you the, know, the New American Standard is written by Protestants, translated by Protestants. And so if the Roman Catholic does it, it's okay. It's a adjective out of that phrase in order to say that it's the faith that's being qualified. That's not what the verse says. You can read all about it in my book, Not by Faith Alone. Wow. Yeah. So the See, there's a lot you don't know, Matt. There's oh. a lot of misconceptions and misrepresentations <laughs> well, flying second. around here. Look, James tells us what kind of faith he's talking about, because he says in verse 19, You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons believe also and shudder. He is talking about a dead kind of faith. That's what he is talking about. No, but he, yes, he, he is. you have to add faith. I mean, you have to add works to faith. That's what he says. You don't add works to faith, because That's Paul teaches us we're not justified. Look, you, look, let me ask you a question. Would you go to heaven, I mean... We're only got a few minutes left in the show here. Would you dare go to heaven and actually say before God, he says, you know, hypothetically, he said, let, why should I let you in? Are you going to say because of your faith and your works? Yeah, because that's what scripture says. That's what tradition says, and that's what the church taught me. Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And I will say to them on that day, get away from me. I never knew you. Yeah, that's talking about false prophets, man. It's a different context. You're they were text again, just like you did with Hebrews Just 7. like you. You are the one claiming that you have faith in God and look at your works. The very thing that they applied, appealed to. Look at my faith. Look at my works. He says, get away from me. No. no. Yes. talking about false prophets doing false works and having false faith. And how do you That's know if a false prophet? Matthew 7. James 2 is not talking about that. Okay? And neither am I. When Abraham was justified by his works, it wasn't false works. He actually took his son up to the mountain and tried to kill him under God's command. That's a true work. Yes, it is. He's manifesting his work. As Paul says in Romans 4, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And Abraham believed God and right. was reckoned in his righteousness. They are talking about Abraham earning by works. No. Nope. not what Abraham now to the, is talking look, about. Hold on, let's talk about what Paul says. By works in the sense that he does a good work for God and God rewards no. him. Look what Paul says. Now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Sure. Does and not work. Find what he meant by work. It's the one, it's on being paid for your works is the kind of works he's talking about there. 
He's not talking about that. In you mean going out and, and mowing the lawn? Abraham was not paid for sacrificing Woo! Isaac. Okay, we got one minute to show. This is too good. You want to pick up another time on, sure. the, on this verse? Matt. <laughs> Anytime. And any topic you want to talk about, I'll be here. Okay. You're not a lot more knowledgeable than Roman Catholicism. I'm still going to send you my paper on first Please six, do. Four, six. Please, please do. Okay, now look, before we go, before we go, um, I, I sincerely hope I haven't offended you. I've said some stuff, strong stuff. Yeah, I, I'm, I hope I haven't offended you, and it no, was never my intention. Never mind either. And I know that we would probably have a good barbecue and argue together and treat each other with respect. Sure. But I... Don't believe the Roman Catholic Church. I know you think I'm wrong. That's all fine. But we're doing this for people's entertainment and information. Okay. Okay? And so, i tell you what. Uh, we'll contact you again. Maybe come on next Monday. How's that? Sounds good. All right. I'll be here. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it a lot. Right. Okay? Bye-bye. Thanks. Okay, bye. Whew. I like that. That's fun stuff. All right, folks. Uh, Romans 4 is what we're going to talk to him about next time. Oh, man. Wages is what you've earned. It's like mowing a lawn. That's what I was asking him. Didn't respond to that. But it's like, you're kidding me. Wow. Man, I'm telling you, fascinating stuff. He's good. He's good. Iron sharpens iron. I'm going to get sharper. Good stuff. Hey, folks, hope you enjoyed the show. Let me know what you think tomorrow night. God bless. Come, Give me a call. And uh, we'll see you then. Okay, bye. Woo! He's good. Man, he's lost. Being that someone else took power over her and, and took her to heaven, whereas Jesus ascended by his own divine power. Uh, but we do believe that is uh, what happened to Mary. Uh, we believe this um, because the church teaches it. And the church is uh, one of our authorities, along with scripture and tradition. Uh, we have no problem believing it because the scripture itself uh, uh, talks about various instances where the bodies of uh, human beings were assumed into heaven, like Elijah, for example. There's no place in the Bible that rejects being assumed into heaven. Uh, so, you know, we have no problem in uh, accepting that as a doctrine. And it's not as if it just came out of thin air. You know, in the 20th century, uh, in 1950, when Pius XII declared it a doctrine of the church, it's not as if he just woke up one morning and said, oh, I think we ought to believe in the assumption of Mary. Uh, this was a doctrine that was talked about it, among the patristic errors, uh, the patristic, uh, in the patristic era, and in, in the medieval ages, uh, prior to the year. Hi, I'm your host, Matt Slick, again, and uh, I hope you all had a good, uh, good Fourth of July holiday. I did. Lots of fireworks, lots of fun, lots of people, uh, lots of kids having a good time. Really enjoyed that. You always enjoy the, the fireworks because the kids are so great, and they really get a kick out of them. I just enjoy watching that more than anything else, actually, so it's a lot of fun. And um, let's see, we've got a lot of things happening. We've got a special guest in tonight, a Roman Catholic apologist on the air with me here. We'll get to him in a second. I'm just going to give you some more information on some stuff later. I'm going to be uh, starting a, a series on Mormonism starting a, t a week from tomorrow night. That's uh, the 14th of July at a local church. I'll give you more information tomorrow on that. If you're interested in going, you can just email me at carmstuff at yahoo.com. You can do that. You can also uh, just go to the Carm homepage, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G, and you can uh, check it out there. Uh, the email's at the bottom of the page. And uh, like I said, I'll give you more information tomorrow about that. Also, I'm doing a Bible study on Friday night, so we're going to be moving it to that church, it looks like, as well. Um, hopefully, everything can. It doesn't mean that if you're not a member full-fledged of the Catholic Church, you cannot be saved. Right. Yeah, I, I will definitely, for the rest of my life, absolutely remain outside the Roman Catholic Church, and I will also advocate that everybody leave the Roman Catholic Church and never go to it. That's my position. Yeah. So I guess I'm going to be lost to go to hell, right? Well, usually what I ask people to do is to hold their conclusions until after the debate is over, and maybe you might change your mind after we discuss these things. Yeah, well, yeah, well that's fine. I, I like uh, people with differing opinions on the show. I really appreciate that. And... Um, we were supposed to talk tonight about uh, the Assumption of Mary, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe you could just tell people what that is and why you believe it. Let me get into well, it. Well, what it is is that uh, at the end of Mary's life, um, what happened to her body and soul? And mm -hmm. The church believes that her body and soul were assumed into heaven. And I, let me just let me explain that by making a distinction between assumed and ascension, because. We believe that Jesus ascended into heaven, as Acts chapter 1 teaches. Mary was assumed um, being... It should be fine. So anyway, I think that's it. Uh, let's get to 
Our guest, a uh, Dr. Sue Jenis, is that right? Sun Jenis. Sun Jenis. You know, I apologize. No problem. Ah, oh, man. I, that's what I thought it was, and then one of the guys wrote something different, so that's why I got <laughs> that one. Yeah, I think it was your uh, guy that led me to the program. He said, he said it wrong also. Oh, okay. Well, my bad. My name's easier to say, you know, Slick. So <laughs> I'd rather have some genus than slick. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're a too skinny kid like I was going to a lot of different schools, uh, then, yeah, you don't want my name. <laughs> but uh, that's the way it goes. So uh, thank you for coming on the show. I really yeah. appreciate it. And uh, you are a Roman Catholic, right? Yes. And you are a hardcore Roman Catholic. I guess you would say that. And you like to defend the Christian faith, or excuse me, the Roman Catholic faith. I'll say. Yes, the Christian faith. Okay, and um, I, I, I don't know. Have you read stuff? Uh, my view on Roman Catholicism. I don't want to offend um, you. But. You know, I've never heard of you, Matt. But okay. somebody, uh, your uh, guy that put together this program, <clears throat> talked to me yesterday and led me to your website. So I looked at a couple things. So I just have to say, I, I looked at a couple YouTube videos mm -hmm. of you and Catholicism. So mm -hmm. I don't know too much about you, but I think I know enough to uh, know you know where you're coming from. Right. Um, Basically, I don't consider Roman Catholicism to be Christian. Mm -hmm. right. and no offense no, I meant. I didn't either for a while, too, because I was a Protestant for 18 years mm -hmm. okay. before I came back to the Catholic Church. Okay. So I understand w why you feel that way. Yeah, I definitely uh, definitely believe it's, uh, it's apostate. I don't mean to be offensive, but I don't believe it's Christian. And uh, I believe that Roman Catholics who believe official Roman Catholic theology are going to be lost and go to hell mm -hmm. and on the Day of Judgment. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if you, how clearly you hold to official Roman Catholic theology. Uh, you know, rebooting my laptop, so when it gets noisy here in a minute, you'll know why. Uh, you know, official Roman Catholic theology says if you're outside the Catholic Church, you're lost. So I don't know if you hold to that or not, but uh, I see that's what the old councils are saying. Well, actually, it says from uh, Benedict, or, or from uh, Boniface VIII and Eugene IV, it says if you remain outside the Catholic Church, you cannot be saved. Mm -hmm. 